Hey there, this is John from Heroes and Legends, and welcome to the third day of Commander 2017 previews. Today appears to be Vampire Day. We got a good look at a lot of the cards from this Mardu Vampire deck, and it actually looks pretty sweet. We'll take a deep dive, I'll give you my thoughts on all the cards, and we'll have a couple stragglers from Dragons and Cats to talk about today as well. Now, quickly before we get started, if you check out the description below, you'll find a couple ways to help support us, one of which is our Amazon affiliate store. Any purchases there, a small percentage will come back to the channel. You'll find a link below too for the Commander 2017 products if you're interested in them. Also, you'll find our Patreon page in that same area. Now, with that out of the way, let's get into today's cards. And we're going to start off with a card that was previously leaked. It's actually a reprint as well, but Wizards did officially confirm it, so I want to throw it out there. It's Scion of the Ur Dragon. Now, if you're a Commander player, you're probably pretty familiar with this card, originally printed in Time Spiral. It was a good Dragon Commander. I mean, it could do some good things for you. It cost one of each color. It's a 4-4 four, four flyer, so... Those stats aren't super exciting considering what you're putting into it, but that ability can be good. It costs two, you search your library for a dragon permanent card, put it into your graveyard. If you do, then the Scion of the Ur Dragon actually becomes a copy of that card until end of turn, and then you shuffle. So it does allow you to basically tutor for whatever dragon you want and turn this into it until end of turn. And it could make for some big plays considering dragons can at times be very powerful creatures. And if you have the right ones in your deck and maybe a way to reanimate, that turns out to, who guessed it, actually sometimes be a really good commander deck. <laughs> so I think it's cool they're including it. You could make this your commander if you wanted to, if you want to go a little bit old school and not use one of the mythic ones. This one does meet the requirements of five colors, so out of the box it will work. But I think it's nice regardless that they did reprint this. It's a fine inclusion. All right, let's look at some of the new stuff. Edgar Markov, and this is going to cost one of each Mardu color, black, white, and red, and three. It's a legendary vampire knight, 4-4, four, four, with eminence. Whenever you cast another vampire spell, if this is in the command zone or on the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one black vampire creature token. It has first strike, it has haste, and whenever this attacks, you get to put a plus one, plus one counter on each vampire you control, which includes... Edgar himself. So that's actually pretty good. A lot of times there'd be other vampires, but because of the casting cost and I think what they're trying to do to push this card, this will also buff itself, which is great. So generally, the card isn't doing anything like flashy or showy or just making you say, wow, I can't believe they printed that ability or this combo so well with this or that. But this card is just a solid workhorse. Like, this is a fine card. Because you got to think, it costs six. That's not super expensive, even though it is three on collars. But then you get yourself a 4-4 four, four, first strike haste, so it can attack in right away. And on top of that, it's going to buff everything else. And it's attacking in as a 5-5 five, five the first time as well, not even a 4-4. Four, four. So keep that in mind when you think about the casting cost. And on top of that, you have the whole token generation where... Now it's also creating an Anthem effect for your tokens. And even if your opponent has an answer for this and it gets destroyed, it gets sent back to the command zone, you still buffed all your stuff, hopefully buffed a few tokens as well. Card seems like it could get a lot of damage across, actually. It just feels very, very economical. And again, not like real flashy. It's not something that's going to catch your eye as, wow, this card is crazy doing weird stuff. It's just doing good stuff, and I feel like I'd be very, very happy to use this as my commander, especially in a more spiky setting. Card just feels super pushed in that way to me. Also, the art looks a little bit like the painting from Ghostbusters 2, so it's got that going forward too. All right, Lysia Sanguine Tribune. Uh, this card was previewed today from the professor on Tolarian Community College. It's black, white, and red, and five. Legendary creature, vampire, soldier, four, four. And this costs one less to cast for each one life you've gained this turn. It has first strike, it has life link. Pay five life, put three plus one plus one counters on this card. Activate this ability only on your turn and only once each turn. What I like about this is they are seemingly anyway, from what we've seen so far, trying to give you a secondary choice for a commander that works strongly with a sub-theme that the deck has coming out of the box. My assumption is, 
Vampires are going to have a life gain sub theme, which makes sense for vampires. A lot of them run life link and such. So if you're all in on that, or perhaps you want to upgrade that deck and add more life gain, then this is a very fine choice for your commander. It's just a secondary direction to go in. And I do like that they have done that. It feels like they're doing that with all the Commander 2017 decks. The card itself, maybe not as explosive as that last card we saw, but with some life gain behind it, it could be good being able to buff this and of course this itself having life link and first strike is kind of nice allows you to keep building that life total later you can pay life to make this card even better so i don't feel like it's as spiky it's maybe a little bit more slow and methodical but i still think it's a good card in the right deck math is fiend seeker this is our third mythic vampire in the deck this one's going to cost just a black a white and red so only three 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 minutes legendary creature vampire at the beginning of your end step Put a bounty counter on target creature and opponent controls. For as long as that creature has a bounty counter on it, it has, when this creature dies, each opponent draws a card and gains two life. Right off the bat, it only costs three. So you can get it out faster, or you can get it out more often. That's nice sometimes in commander games. And it's a 3-3. Three, three. It's not huge, but it has menace, so you can get some damage across here and there. So I do like that. The ability is just fun. I mean, here's the thing. This isn't one of those super spiky cards necessarily or anything like that, but there are decks that reward you for getting your commander out either earlier or even more frequently, so this could fit into some of those game plans. But secondly, too, just the fun you're going to have putting these bounty counters on creatures, it just feels like it could be a good time, right? And that's what commander is all about. So I do like the inclusion of these cards that maybe aren't power level as hard as some of the other ones, but are very, very fun to play. All right, next we're going to look at a cycle. This is a curse cycle, actually. And I will say, this is actually pretty well designed. I'm a big fan of what they've done here. So let's look at one of these, and we'll talk through them all. The first one here, Curse of Vitality. It costs a white and two, or a curse enchantment. Enchant player. Whenever enchanted player is attacked, you gain two life. Each opponent attacking that player does the same. So you put this curse on somebody, and then whenever you attack them, in this case, you'll gain two life. But also, when an opponent attacks you gain two life, but they also gain two life. So it really encourages this weird political gameplay where an opponent's got some decisions to make. They could attack the opponent that has the curse on them. They'll get a benefit from it, but another player is also getting the benefit from it. And at certain times, that's going to be just fine, depending on the power level at the table. But other times, if that player is also getting the benefit, is becoming maybe a little too strong of a presence on the board then maybe you don't want to attack that person. And when you're putting the curse out, who do you put it on? Do you put it on the person that's open for a lot of attacks that so you get more bonus out of it? Or do you put it on the person that has a stronger board presence because you're trying to encourage other people to whittle down that board presence? Very interesting decision-making behind these cards. Awesome design. Let's look at the others. We have Curse of Herbosity in blue, which is fitting. A blue in two, or a curse, of course. Now this time around, when enchanted players attacked, draw a card, each opponent attacking that player does the same. You could argue that's actually a lot more interesting than the white version. Drawing a card can be a very, very powerful effect. So even though it costs the same, both of these cost three. Yeah, the blue one seems pretty sweet to me. Uh, the black one is Curse of Disturbance, black and two for this one. This time, whenever the enchanted player is attacked, create a 2-2 black zombie creature token. Each opponent attacking that player does the same. So being able to go a little bit wide with tokens, that seems cool. Curse of Opulence in red. This one only costs one red. And this time around, whenever enchanted player is attacked, create a colorless artifact token named Gold. It has sacrificed the artifact to add one mana of any color to your mana pool. Each opponent attacking that player does the same. And finally, Curse of the Bounty is green. And that one is a green and a one. And whenever enchanted player is attacked, untap all non-land permanents you control. Each opponent attacking that player untaps all non-land permanents that he or she controls. So like I said, I love the design here. I think they did a great job creating a curse that is actually interactive. It's not just I'm going to throw this curse on you and every upkeep is going to do something to you that's bad or anything like that. This is a curse that interacts directly with everybody sitting at that table playing the game. And that is super sweet. If you're wondering about distribution, considering this is a five color cycle of a series of cards that is in four commander decks what they did say was there's going to be two in each of the decks so that's pretty cool i'm actually excited about these again these aren't necessarily super super powerful or anything like that but they do make for fun gameplay and i think they will be a good time especially out of the box 
All right, speaking of interesting cards, the Fairy's Protection. This one costs a white and two. It's an instant. Until your next turn, your life total can change, and you have protection from everything. All permanents you control phase out. Exile to Fairy's Protection. <laughs> okay, so I'll say the obvious first. It's 2017, and they just made a card with phasing. Now, <laughs> I wasn't the biggest fan of phasing even back in the day. I felt like it was unintuitive. It confused a lot of players, and even if you understood it, it was a very slow kind of hokey mechanic but this is a good use of it like this totally makes sense it's almost like a drawback for being able to protect yourself in some ways but also protects your things at the same time by having the whole phase out happen and phasing does seem like the best way to do it so i like the design here i think it's great beyond that the whole package of this card is really awesome especially for old school players the fact that in the art here he's like phasing out the whole city protecting the city and you have the foreground art feeling very mirage-esque with the elephants and everything it just feels old school and awesome so i love the card i should probably talk about what the card actually does because it is a good card if you're about to get killed in a game you play this at instant speed and you survive that alone is pretty good, especially if you have that person at the table who's the combo player. Well, this is a nice way to kind of muddle that up a little bit, right? And also, on the flip side of the coin, if you have some sort of combo that you want to get off and you want to protect yourself, this could protect you while you're doing it too. So there's a couple ways to look at this card. Overall, though, I just really like the design. I think it's super sweet, and I love the art, and I love the fact that Teferi's on it. New Blood. This one costs two black and two. It's a sorcery. It's an additional cost to cast, though. You tap and untap vampire you control. Gain control of target creature. Change the text of that creature by replacing all instances of one creature type with vampire. A couple ways you can look at this card. First off, it's just a nice swing card. You get to take the best thing on the board and steal it, basically. And for four mana and tapping a vampire, that actually feels pretty economical. It is sorcery speed, not instant, but that's fine. I would expect that from a card that actually could create that powerful of a swing. Now, there's another way you could play this card. You can actually play it on something you control to change the text to vampire. And that gets interesting when it comes to maybe other tribal buff cards or tribal lord cards that you might already have in your deck that you just want to basically change the text for four mana. Maybe that's worth it. And you can probably think of a whole bunch of examples. Just off the top of my head, I'm thinking of things like Edgewalker. Uh, there's a number of them. I mean, basically anything that says X type of creature gets a bonus, you could just simply change that to vampires. And maybe that's just good enough for some decks that there's not a better target out there for it. So I like the versatility. It's a cool card. And even if you play it against an opponent, it's still really good. Of course, it can be a huge swing. Next we have Patron of the Vein. Two black and four, Vampire Shaman, four four flying. When this enters the battlefield, destroy target creature and opponent controls. Whenever a creature and opponent controls dies, exile it and put a plus one plus one counter on each vampire you control. So you're paying six for this, but wow, is there a lot packed into this card? First off, it's a 4-4 flyer, which is actually a 5-5 flyer for the most part, considering you are hopefully going to destroy something when it enters the battlefield. Now, on top of that, you're also buffing your team of vampires, so it's giving a very sweet anthem effect. And then finally, on top of all of that, it's also disrupting graveyard mechanics by not allowing your opponent's creatures to go back to the graveyard when they die. So this is actually an amazing card for six mana. I don't know what else to say about it. I mean, it just covers a lot of different things that you want it to be able to do in a commander game. Phenomenal all around. Bloodsworn Steward. Another card I'm really high on. This one is sweet. Two red and two for a 4-4 four, four flying vampire knight. Commander creatures you control get plus two, plus two in haste. There's so many different angles from this card to talk about. So let's talk about the commander angle first. Giving your commander haste is awesome because it just speeds things up a little bit you get that extra damage across also gives them the plus two plus two so that's phenomenal but even if that wasn't there i would have been happy with the haste on top of that this is a four four flyer for four <laughs> a four four flyer for four in red what <laughs> so <laughs> the card itself just has a super high power level even if you ignore that ability this is fantastic uh, this will be a great card, not only for this Vampire deck out of the box, but a card that you will certainly want to play in a lot of Commander decks that support red. I mean, there's just no reason not to in a lot of cases. The only thing critical I'll say about the card is I don't know why he needs a horse if he can fly, but, you know, here we are. Great card. 
Crimson Honor Guard, two red and three, Vampire Knight, four, five, Trample at the beginning of each player's end step. Crimson Honor Guard deals four damage to that player unless he or she controls a commander. Well, I'll say this about the card. It certainly hoses a Loro, right? <laughs> the player that plays that card, not always popular at the table. Uh, this kind of messes up that strategy. Maybe that's the sole reason they made the card. I don't know. On its own, if that's not the case, the card's okay. Like a 4-5 or five Trample for 5 is just fine. And if you have a cheap commander that you can get out and keep recasting pretty frequently then yes, you can create a situation where this is going to hurt you less than everybody else at the table. But keep in mind, it does hurt you. It's at the beginning of each player's end step. This will happen, so not just opponents. Uh, so yes, you can be hurt by this card too, which means it could backfire in certain situations. And that leads to a little bit high variance, maybe a little too high variance for a lot of players to want to play. But again, I feel like it's a hose card more than anything. Next, we have Disrupt Decorum. I love the name of that card. Two red and two. It's a sorcery. Go to all creatures you don't control, which makes sense with the name for sure. Dinner and politics don't mix. <laughs> so uh, this is awesome, actually. Just the whole package here, the art, the flavor text. It's actually the first time I read the flavor text. Usually I read them before I do the video, but for some reason I missed that. Um, anyway, uh, besides the flavor win here, obviously, the ability itself, actually really good. It creates action, and it also protects you. It's a sorcery. It's a one-time deal, but you play it, and it really focuses on trying to speed up the game a little bit and it's a perfect like pillow four card right like you go ahead and play this you're just making the opponents do your bidding right they have to attack they can't attack you and at least if able so if you are the last opponent available then yes they do have to attack you uh, but it does create this situation where you're forcing action on the board. That's something that this mechanic did really well in Conspiracy Take the Crown. It, it just made the games faster. It sped things along. So it's not surprising to me that if you're playing these out of the box, that Wizards is going to try to put some cards in there that speed the games along. This is a perfect one. It's actually a really good card in some builds for sure. Kindred Charge. Two red and four. It's a sorcery. Choose a creature type. For each creature you control of the chosen type, Create a token that's a copy of that creature. Those tokens gain haste. Exile them at the beginning of the next end step. So obviously it's great for tribal. You're creating a lot of stuff, attacking in. It's going to be better, though, if you have, for example, a lot of good entrance battlefield effects on your creatures and stuff like that. So you can kind of work your deck to make this card better than it is just in a vacuum. And that's probably what you'll want to do in most cases. But overall, it's just a good wide attack option as well. Maybe put away a game or put away your last opponent or something like that. Gwisali Slingers. This one's a green and four cat warrior, three, five reach. Whenever this or another cat enters the battlefield under your control, you may destroy target artifact or enchantment. So this feels a lot like Harmonic Sliver to me, but for cats, and that's actually pretty sweet. It's a little more expensive, obviously, at five, but it gives you a nice body with reach, too. You can block some flyers, which is good. Sometimes green struggles with flyers. So overall, great package, and you know there's going to be targets out there. Uh, this is, I think, the lone cat card that we're seeing today. We saw a lot of cats on Monday, a few yesterday, but uh, overall, this cat deck is actually looking pretty incredible, too, from what we've seen. And this is a great way to take out, even if it's just some mana rocks, but also some big enchantments. It's a good card to deal with things like Pillow Fort, for example, that relies a lot of times on enchantments to keep you from attacking them or keep other players from attacking them. So it does kind of hose strategies like that. Very intriguing card. I actually like it a lot. Mirror of the Forebearers. This costs two. It's an artifact. When this enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Pay one until end of turn. This will become a copy of target creature you control of the chosen type, except it's an artifact in addition to its other types. This is interesting because we recently saw Mirage Mirror in Hour of Devastation, and that's in some ways a better card than this one, but it is a little more expensive. So this is a cheaper, leaner version of that, and that's just fine if you're playing a tribal deck and you're planning on copying some tribal creatures for value, it's going to be just fine at that. I don't know if I would play this in lieu of Mirage Mirror necessarily, even though this is a little cheaper and a little faster perhaps, but at the same time in Commander, I think you should have enough mana to run a Mirage Mirror. Now, if that's really important to you, you could run both, of course, but yeah, it's just a little underwhelming because we saw a more interesting card in the last Satin Hour of Devastation, but it's still going to be fine for Tribal, I think. 
Unstable Obelisk. This costs three. It's an artifact. You can tap it for colorless mana. Pay seven. Tap and sacrifice. Destroy target permanent. This is actually a reprint. It was from Commander 2013. So it's been a number of years. And it's a fine card. Like, it's not expensive or anything. You can pick these up for under a quarter pretty easily if you want to. But I think it's a good inclusion. These mana rocks that later on have some value by being able to destroy target permanent, I think are good. And keep in mind, it's target permanent, not non-land permanent. So it can deal with just about any problem you can think of. It can even handle some of these lands that can be problematic at times. So I do like that, and I think it's a great inclusion in these decks. All right, having said that... Those are the cards for today. We actually saw quite a few of them. I'm glad I did the video later yesterday and covered 10 cards there because this would have been a really long video if I didn't. Um, now, tomorrow, I assume, is going to be Wizard Day. So we're going to find out more about that Grixis Wizard deck. My assumption is on Friday, then we'll get the full deck list and we'll start our full deck reviews for the next five days, Friday and beyond. So I'm looking forward to that. If a lot of stuff happens this afternoon, I will do a follow-up video. I don't know if it'll be anything like yesterday or not. We'll wait and see. But if not, I'll definitely see you tomorrow with more cards. And I'm really excited, like I said, about seeing the Wizards. So that's going to be sweet. Until next time, hey, thanks for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe and have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching. This video is made possible by the generous support of viewers like you on Patreon. Check out the description below for links to our Patreon page as well as our Amazon affiliate store, where a small percentage of all sales will also help support the channel. Finally, if you haven't had a chance yet to subscribe, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any new videos on Heroes and Legends. Talk to you again soon, and have a great day.